Hello, I'm Dr. Benjamin Strong, the Chief Medical Officer of Virtual Radiologic, or VRAD. I started my career with an internal medicine residency and followed that with three years of work as an emergency physician. I then returned to training for a radiology residency and a fellowship in body and MSK MRI. In the course of my over 20 years in radiology, I have worked as a private practice radiologist, an academic radiologist, and for the last 17 years as a teleradiologist for VRAD. I have been the chief medical officer there for eight years and am licensed to practice in all 50 states. Neuroradiology trauma. So this one, I broke into two groups of 12. We're going to have 12 intracranial hemorrhage cases and then 12 of face and spine trauma. Here's a disturbing one. Uh, every teleradiologist's worst nightmare. This is an isodense subdural hemorrhage. It's right there and it actually covers most of the right frontal lobe surface. You can see there is some midline shift ever so slight, but certainly present. We're already into it. And you see the white matter does not extend to the periphery as it should, right? and it extends all the way up. You can really appreciate it by virtue of the asymmetry. And I love to tease our neuroradiologists. Uh, it's one organ, it's always symmetric. How do you guys miss anything? Well, <laughs> this I guess is why, that is a, a pretty tricky finding. But that is definitely uh, verified with MR, a pretty significant isodense subdural hematoma. Should you watch that one more time? All right. This is quite a case. Obviously, you're not going to miss this extra axial density. Pretty significant subdural there. There are also regions of paramesencephalic density, interpeduncular density, and intraventricular, of course, as well. So there are multiple locations of hemorrhage here. There's significant dilation of the left lateral ventricle. That's asymmetric, and you'll certainly see why. It's related to the shift, right? We're going to see an effaced. A right lateral ventricle higher up here, which you can see there. And now, due to uh, transmitted pressure on the foramen Monroe, the left lateral ventricle is dilating up significantly. But what I really want to show you here is the subfalcine herniation. That is right frontal lobe that has herniated under the falx, occluding the right. ACA and causing an infarct. That is the dread complication of severe shift. Look at this. You can see that ischemic right frontal cortex actually bending around the falx on that cut. And here it is showing you the extent higher up as well. Again, more subfalcine herniation. Okay, so there's the interventricular hemorrhage, paramesencephalic, interventricular, but here, that herniating right frontal cortex, all of which is infarcted. Let that run again. You don't see that every day either. Okay, so that is a subfalcine herniation with anterior cerebral artery occlusion and subsequent infarction. Okay, another one with a uh, big shift and the effects of it. This one is a left-sided extraaxial fluid uh, with density. This is more mixed. This does have that sort of stuttering appearance. Looks like an acute on chronic bleed. But here, that is the left uncus pushed way over, right? Extreme medial displacement of the uncus, which has caused a trapped horn. This is the very tip. This portion is the very tip 
of the left lateral ventricle inferior horn, and it is squeezed, pinched right here due to the uncle herniation, and it's dipping there right over the tent, and it's pinched, and that's what's called a trapped horn. So that's the sign of extreme uncle herniation, uh, most likely uh, very difficult to reduce, unlikely to be uh, resolving. Here, in addition, is a sign of compromise to brain stem circulation. That is a DeRay hemorrhage. Now, we saw the intrapeduncular on the, uh, the interpeduncular hemorrhage on the preceding case. This one's actually in the tegmentum of the midbrain, and that is a Duray hemorrhage related to ischemia and necrosis. Uh, obviously, uh, that's a path-proven diagnosis, as was the trapped horn, uh, as all of these findings suggest this patient did not survive. So there's a nice example of acute on-chronic extraaxial hemorrhage. Let's look again at that medial uncle displacement and the trapped horn. And then lastly, that ill-defined focus of density in the tegmentum of the midbrain. Trapped horn, Duray hemorrhage. Okay, a couple just warnings for you to watch out for some more subtle stuff. This is isolated interpeduncular hemorrhage. It's the only evidence of intracranial hemorrhage this patient has. Obviously, you're not going to do anything specifically about this, but in these patients with even a tiny amount of subarachnoid hemorrhage, there is no question there is an association with much more significant brain injury that will come to light down the road. So it's an important prognosticator. And even if, uh, even if you think, ah, who cares about these things? Obviously, we're not looking for that tiny dot of subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, just to say we found it or to point anyone to go and drain it, right? It's, again, an important prognosticator. So there you go, really on just one or two cuts, and that's all you get. So that's an interpeduncular subarachnoid hemorrhage. This is another SAH, but this one intraventricular. And this is a great example of the points I've been making to date, right? You can see there is a cast, right, an intraventricular clot that is smaller than the actual fourth ventricle now. You can see the dilation of the inferior horns here, tipping you to the presence of hydrocephalus, even if the ventricles aren't remarkably dilated, right? Which these really aren't that dilated, right? But you can see there is, again, that cast within the lateral ventricles and the third ventricle as well. So just a little bit of intraventricular hemorrhage. And again, that dilated inferior horn should tip you in a brain this young to the fact that hydrocephalus is present. So there are those horns, and there's the dilated third ventricle. There it is. And the lateral ventricles. And there's a tiny bit of hemorrhage in the sulci as well. But there is a little bit of hemorrhage basically in every one of the ventricles. There it is in the fourth, and in the third, and the laterals. So that's an acute traumatic intraventricular hemorrhage with mild hydrocephalus. All right. This one is a case of hemorrhagic contusions. We saw some in the inferior frontal region. Uh, this is probably the next most common spot. Obviously, the temporal poles and occipital poles uh, are subject to this as well. But here are bilateral hemorrhagic contusions. You likely would have caught the one on the left, but that one on the right is pretty subtle. So that salt and pepper appearance, hypodense cortex with tiny dots of added density, consistent with petechial hemorrhage, right above the petrous ridges there where they tend to get roughed up. 
So there, you can see it on the, the left-sided one is larger and does extend up one cut. You can see a little vasogenic edema above it. The one on the right, uh, you basically just get that one cut, tiny bit of hypodensity, a few dots of density, and that's it. So those are hemorrhagic contusions, classic appearance in a pretty typical location. All right, our last intracranial hemorrhage is a sheer injury. Adam's triad is described as brainstem, corpus callosum or septum pellucidum, and uh, subcortical white matter. And that's the classic triad of sheer injury. I, I just, for whatever reason, I've never gotten a brainstem hemorrhage in this. Uh, I see it all over the place, certainly the subcortical stuff. Certainly the septum pellucidum or corpus callosum, but what I've always noticed is the medial temporal lobe gets these as well. I've got three or four cases of shear injury with hemorrhage in that exact location, and I just can't uh, can't seem to find one with it in the brainstem. So I'm going to start calling this Strong's triad, and we're swapping out medial temporal for brainstem. So there you go. But there is a pretty typical hemorrhage, at least in my experience, in the medial temporal region. This one's in the septum pellucidum. See a nice ill-defined density there. And here is the classic appearance of a subcortical dot of hemorrhage in a pretty typical location. You can get, of course, the subcortical stuff anywhere, but it's pretty typically in the frontal lobes. Again, they move a little more uh, when you're uh, horrifically traumatized. There's the medial temporal. Septum pellucidum, right under the corpus. And subcortical white matter. Just a classic shear injury with multifocal punctate hemorrhages. Let's look at that one more time. All right, I think that finishes up intracranial hemorrhage for us.